Hello and welcome back. I hope you've had a wonderful winter. I know that I have. Today, we're gonna go back to an earlier point in music history and to some extent an earlier point in the life of this channel. Because I'm going to be talking about some grunge. Any successful movement is going to spawn its imitators. And in grunge's heyday in the early to mid 90s, there were a horde of groups trying to ride the trends established by giants of the genre like Nirvana and Pearl Jam. Honestly, through those imitators, grunge had kind of a malignant legacy well into the 2000s. Its dirty and yet processed riffs and baritone yowling formed a key component of the post-grunge and butt rock that plagued the rock scene of the 2000s. There were so many of those bands, and you can blame almost all of them on either Pearl Jam or Alice in Chains. But I'm not here to talk about those guys. No, I'm here to talk about one of the original grunge imitators. Bush. An English band fronted by Gavin Rossdale, a songwriter who had spent the better part of a decade trying and failing to become a star, Bush rose to prominence in early 95 with 16 Stone an album that answered the question, what if every song on In Utero by Nirvana had sounded like Heart Shaped Box? I have kind of mixed feelings on these guys. On the one hand, there really is no need for them in a world where In Utero exists. On the other hand, next to all those other post-grunge bands, they sound positively Olympian by comparison. They're nothing I seek out, but if I'm in the car listening to an alt station and Machine Head comes on, I'm not gonna change the channel. But as much of a smash hit as it was, 16 Stone is not the album I'm talking about today. No, that honor falls to Razorblade Suitcase, the second Bush album, released slightly under two years later, and produced by one of the great underground heroes of the age, Steve Albini. And responsible for the engineering job on Surfer Rosa by the Pixies, Rid of Me by PJ Harvey, some Jesus Lizard stuff, and In Utero by Nirvana, just to name a few. Now when I found out about this, it came as something of a surprise to me, because Steve Albini has a reputation for being so pretentious and so snobby, that if you played him his own music, and somehow presented it as something new, he would probably flip out and say it was the worst thing he'd ever heard in his life. With such an illustrious pedigree and coming on the back of a mammoth success like Sixteen Stone, who would expect Razorblade Suitcase to be a legendary album? And it was commercially successful, but by the time the album came out in late 96, the musical winds were changing. With most of the major grunge bands out of commission by 97, the music scene shifted more towards boy and girl groups, big beat electronic music, and lighter, softer, and in many cases more cerebral forms of rock, with nu metal and butt rock just barely visible on the horizon. So Razorblade Suitcase didn't really get to enjoy the kind of cultural afterlife that its older sibling has, being today mostly remembered, if it's remembered at all, as perhaps the last major grunge album. But is that also ran reputation justified? Let's find out. So the album opens up with what I'm pretty sure is a dog snarling, although I, honestly, the first time I listened, I was convinced that this was somebody snoring. And then right away you get some great noisy guitar bits going into one of the better tracks on the album. It's definitely a bit Nirvana, but it's the less commercial side of Nirvana. More along the lines of some of the weirder stuff on In Utero. And the production is more Surfer Rosa, which is a good thing. So track two is a dark, brooding kind of thing. It had a weird music video, longer than the track by a pretty significant margin. It's one of those. And overall, I would say this is one of the best songs on the album. They're opening right on the gate with some pretty strong stuff. Although it is kind of generic to the grunge scene in general. 
This was the big hit single at the time, both in America and in their native land, which is significant because they were never all that big over there. I mean, they had a following, but they weren't superstars or anything. It went straight up to number seven, uh, which for a grunge band in the UK was pretty good because uh, in case you don't know the musical history, the UK was on kind of a different wave in the 90s than America was. They kind of skipped the drab and dire gloomy bit we had and went straight into the Dayglo Technicolor party all the time side of the 90s. You know, Cool Britannia and all that. Now as far as the track itself goes, Steve Albini apparently didn't like this at all. He didn't think it should be on the album. I think he thought it was derivative. Uh, and I have to kind of agree with that. Uh, because I've always felt like this is a sort of a rewrite of Glycerin off of 16 Stone. I mean, it is memorable. It's an earworm. There's no disputing that. If you ask somebody to s mention one thing from Razorblade Suitcase, hell, if you ask me to remember one thing from Razorblade Suitcase, it's this track. But I can't say it's one I would put on by choice. This is another strong track. It has some cool guitar work, and it's nice and abrasive and a little off-kilter. Although that drum intro always makes me think they're gonna bust into some early Beach Boys. Or Yola Tango. This is a good balladish long thing. It's a bit one note, but I like the part in the middle where it sort of breaks down for a little bit. I like this one too. Some cool guitar stuff happening here. Uh, even if I do like the verses a lot better than the choruses. Mouth is where things start to change. You know, it's slower, the hooks are less front and center. Not that there were huge, strong hooks on the other tracks before it, but you, you get what I'm trying to say here, I hope. You better believe that it took all of my very little discipline not to put a Thelonious Monk joke in right here. Now, all non-comedy aside, this is actually one of my favorite tracks on here. It's a pretty good ballad-ish thing. It's hard to say. With some really cool strings that remind me a lot of Albini's work on Rid of Me by PJ Harvey. Think like man-sized sextet and that kind of thing, although much less frantic and deranged. Someday you will find me caught between the landslide. I like the lyrics in this one, although they are probably just a little bit silly. And the track is perhaps just a little bit too long for what it is, but, you know, I like it. There's some really cool instrumental stuff here in isolation. You know, the Rid of Me strings are back once again. Always glad to hear them. But in the context of the album, I'm kind of burned out by the time we're getting here. Like I said, it's not a bad track. And it would probably make a really good deep cut on a better album, but like I said, man, it's just... At least the album ends pretty strong. These last two tracks are pretty good. Tone Driven is another kind of ballad-ish thing, you know. The lyrics are a bit whatever, but the strings are used really well, and the music is fairly interesting. I like this track, but I can't say it entirely earns its almost seven minutes. Although at least it doesn't bore me during that time. Don't get me wrong, I enjoy it, 
But by the same token, I'm mostly just happy the album's ending. Razorblade Suitcase is... okay. I wouldn't call it a bad album by any means, but I can't really call it a good one either. On a sonic level, it's just about perfect. Steve Albini delivers the goods in the engineering department as he does on basically every other album I've ever heard him work on. But in spite of that, I can't help but feel that the end product is just a little bit muddled. The abrasive, noisy grunge stuff is great, yeah, but it's not supported by the same quality level of songwriting that was featured on the first Bush album. And it's unfortunate, too, because parts of Razorblade Suitcase, especially that second half, feels like they were going for a more experimental, less commercial approach. It just doesn't wind up quite working for them. I don't know whether they didn't know how to do it or the record company wouldn't let them, but the end product winds up fitting into this weird musical uncanny valley where it's both too abrasive and harsh to make good commercial rock, but also too polished and well-constructed to make really good art rock. Like I said, I'm torn in my opinion about this because I do respect a lot of things about this album. Even just working with Steve Albini took some guts because the press always sort of ridiculed Bush. They were compared to Nirvana a lot. Even Rolling Stone, a publication that has almost always bowed down to cash and prioritized top-selling acts, kind of made fun of them at the time. You know, the weirder, more experimental, abrasive direction. I approve of all of that. But at the same time, I have to agree with the critics back in 96. The band just didn't bring a strong enough set of hooks to the table to justify the running time of this album, especially considering it stretches out to over an hour. It's not a bad album, but by the same token, I can't really recommend this to anybody unless you have a much higher tolerance for grunge than I do. Doing my research for this video, I got the distinct impression that Bush were one of those bands you kinda had to be around for, and I wasn't. But that being said, 16 Stone holds up for the most part. If you're looking for sort of diet nirvana with a little extra sprinkling of hooks. It's not a bad album to check out, but this one, this one I would avoid unless, as I said, you're into that less hooky, more weird, grungy sound, which I am into to a certain extent, but you know, all in all, I would rate this, I think I would rate this about a six. That's, I, w I won't go lower, but I, I really can't go higher than that. It's, it's acceptable, and as an album for grunge to have sort of closed out on, I, I can't help but feel it's a bit disappointing, to be perfectly honest with you. So yeah, that was Razorblade Suitcase, kind of a mixed bag, but an interesting album to go through nonetheless. Next time, I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to be doing. I have a collection video I'm looking to upload. I have some other videos in the pipeline, but nothing immediate. I'm gonna try really hard to keep a weekly update schedule this year. I know I've experimented with that in previous years and it hasn't really worked, but we're gonna give it another shot. Maybe third time's the charm, so. Anyway, until next time, I will see you all later.